Hello, everyone. This is the October webinar presented by the Essex County Branch of Ontario Ancestors. My name is Linda Urquhart, and I'll be your host for tonight. Cindy Robichaud and Pat Clancy will be monitoring the questions. Thanks to them for that. Before we start, we would like to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home, including the first inhabitants of Essex County, the Anishinaabe group, part of the Three Fires Confederacy, comprising the bands Potawatomi, Ottawa and Ojibwa or Chippewa, as well as the Huron or Wendat or Wyandot bands. We must all acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and consider how we can each in our own way, try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Thanks for joining us. We hope you all enjoyed your Thanksgiving celebrations and had a chance to visit with family and share some of your family history discoveries with them. Just a reminder that this presentation is being recorded and will be added to our YouTube channel. Also, everyone is muted and your camera is turned off during the presentation. Questions will be answered following the presentation. Just add your questions as we go along to the chat box, which you will find when you hover your mouse at the bottom of your screen. We will add a couple of handouts to the chat box during the presentation. They are brochures with different types of Indigenous history sources and one that has some resources of archives to look at. For those who are first time visitors to our webinars, we are one of the 35 branches or special interest groups of Ontario Ancestors, also known as the Ontario Genealogical Society which is the largest member-supported genealogical organization in Canada. It was founded in 1961 with its mission to encourage, bring together, and assist those interested in the pursuit of family history and to preserve Ontario's genealogical heritage. We are the Essex County branch of Ontario Ancestors. Here are the links that we show every webinar, but it is useful to visit them periodically as new things are added all the time. Feel free to take a screenshot. The first link is to our parent organization, Ontario Ancestors, where you will find many Ontario resources. Just add your ancestor's name to the search bar and see what you find. Next is the link to the Essex Branch website, which has Essex County resources, including our members library, which is packed full of local resources. Other links include our YouTube channel where you can review past presentations. We always encourage you to interact with us by joining our Facebook group and following us on Twitter and Instagram. We also wanted to remind everyone that Ontario Ancestors is offering the Kiefer Essay Award, which is again up for competition. Any current Ontario Ancestors member can submit their unpublished family history story, 1,500 to 2,000 words, to be eligible for a cash prize. Of, and first and second place winners uh, will get an annual Ontario Ancestors membership. Further information is on the Ontario Ancestors website. Look it over, and if you have a story to tell, please join the competition. The deadline for submissions is November the 1st, so good luck. Here are some webinars upcoming that you might find interesting. On Thursday, the Lambton Branch is presenting my 2022 Irish Palatine trip, Never Give Up the Search. On Friday, the Kent branch features Alan Campbell discussing not researching in the rain, researching in England from away. On Saturday, October 15th at, a, at 10 a.m., the Kingston branch has a webinar called Scandal, Slavery and Survival, More Tales from New France. And on Tuesday, October the 18th, the Sudbury District Branch, along with the Nipissing Branch, the Sault Ste. Marie and District of Algoma Branch, and the Greater Sudbury Public Library are hosting a joint presentation given by Maureen Taylor, better known as the photo detective. And on Thursday, November the 3rd, 
uh, Ontario Ancestors monthly webinar called Neither Rain Nor Sleet will be presented by Laura Karup. She will be discussing the genealogical significance of post office records found in unfamiliar databases that she has discovered. And on Tuesday, November 29th at 7 p.m., there will be the last scheduled chat with the Family Tree Maker user group. Whether you are a new user of Family Tree Maker or an experienced pro, you will be amazed at the information you can discover with these group sessions. For other webinars, just check out the events calendar at the Ontario Ancestors website. You can find it under the Education tab. We are pleased to announce that AIRS, also known as the Harrow Early Immigrant Research Society, will be celebrating their 50 year anniversary on Saturday, October 29th from 1 to 4 p.m. You are encouraged to attend this celebration. Just RSVP that you can attend by contacting them either by the phone number here on the screen or their email. Our November webinar will feature Judy Munn, a writer, speaker, blogger, presenter, and researcher. She has been researching her family tree from the age of 12, specializing in French Canadian, Acadian, Native American, Scottish, and Michigan, Ontario, and Quebec research. Many of you may have been introduced to Judy at Rutex, where she has presented in the past. We're looking forward to finding out how to handle those family roadblocks in our own research so that we no longer have those dead ends. And now for tonight's presentation, joining us is McKelvey Kelly, a PhD student at the University of Saskatchewan, who will share her research on the Wyandotte women in Anderton Cemetery. And just a few words introducing McKelvey. She's a sixth generation settler on her mother's side and a fourth generation settler on her father's side of Italian and Irish descent. She was born and raised in Fernie, British Columbia, the original territory of the Tunaha nation. Her mother's family has been living in Fernie since it was established in the late 1800s. She is a historian who focuses on community engaged work with indigenous peoples. She completed her undergraduate history degree in Treaty 7 territory with the Nitsitapi or Blackfoot Confederation. In 2019, she moved to Treaty 6 and completed her master's degree in history at the University of Saskatchewan with the Wyandotte of Anderton Nation. Today, she's in the University of Saskatchewan PhD program, continuing community engaged work with the Wyandotte Nation of Kansas and Wyandotte women. So now I'm going to turn it over to McKelvey. So go ahead and share your screen. Go ahead. Perfect. So thank you for that introduction. Kwe uh, Kwe, everyone, which is uh, in Wyandotte, how you say hello. Tija May, thank you all for coming this evening. I would also like to recognize that I'm currently living in Kansas City, Kansas, which is the ancestral homelands of the Ka, the Oto, the Nutachi, and the Osage nations, as well as the treaty lands of the Wyandotte and Delaware nations. I honor and respect these indigenous peoples who were forced to cede their territory and endure generations of genocide. I am honored to be a visitor here and a friend to the Wyandotte people who have allowed me to share their stories. Today, I'm going to focus on my master's history thesis that was conducted with the Wyandotte of Anderton Nation from the Detroit Windsor Corridor. This presentation situates the cemetery within the historical context of colonialism and women's history. So, a brief outline of what I'm going to go over today I'm going to discuss pre contact Wyandots and what women were doing before contact the dispersal and relocation that took place just after contact with Europeans, as well as the Wyandotte of Anderton Nation. And I'm gonna talk about Wyandotte women and then the Wyandotte Cemetery. So let's begin with who are the Anderton Wyandots? 
The Wyandotte of Anderton are part of a modern transnational confederacy known as the Wendat or Wandat Confederacy. In the historical records, they have also been called Wendat with an eight, Wyandot, Huron, and Huron Wendat. They are the descendants of the Patoons and the Neutrals from the Wendat from Wendaki Ian, which is also known as Huronia more commonly. And this location is on the present day shores of Georgian Bay, Ontario. And today the Confederacy is made up of four nations, the Huron Wendat in Quebec, the Wyandotte of Nation of Kansas in Kansas City, the Wyandotte Nation of Oklahoma, and the Wyandotte of Anderton Nation in Michigan. The Wyandotte's traditional territory spanned a vast region from Georgian Bay to present day the St. Lawrence and on the shores of the Great Lakes, Michigan, since time immemorial. They have also lived on waterfronts of Detroit, Ecorse, Rouge, Huron, and the Raisin Rivers, as well as the islands in the Detroit River and Lake Erie areas. The Anderton Nation did not leave their homelands in Detroit during the 1842 and 1843 re Indian removal policies in the U.S. Rather, they stayed in the region and helped develop the Detroit and Windsor areas. In order to understand some of the changes that took place in the 19th century with the Anderton Reserve, we need to understand some of Wyandotte society before all these relocations and contact with Europeans. The Wyandots follow a common Iroquoian or Natawekan ethnic heritage, language, agriculture, and matrilineal social order. The Wyandots were a matricentric society, and matricentric societies are structured around the female line empowering women's authority in both private and public spheres. The pre-contact Wyandots were part of a confederacy that consisted of five autonomous nations, which you can see here on the map and the slides, the Bear, the Rock, the Deer, the Marsh Nation, and the Cord Nation. And each nation was organized around 12 matrilineal clans. And at the time of European encounters in the 1600s, Wyandotte villages contained several longhouses designed to hold roughly six families each, as well as a village burial ground. And each village was palisaded and occupied for roughly 20 to 30 years. While men held public positions as war and civil headmen, warriors, and hunters, women controlled most other aspects of Wyandotte life. For instance, women worked the agricultural fields, cultivating corn, beans, and squash, which is more commonly known as the Three Sisters. And they held authority over home and domestic life. Women were also the heads of clans and exercised their authority over the selection of chiefs and headmen as clan mothers. And faith keepers were predominantly women as well. And a faith keeper was a spiritual leader who organized festivals, community events, um, made necessary arrangements for gatherings. Sometimes they were healers. And faith keepers also monitored and supervised their community's behaviors, reporting inappropriate actions to the council. And faith keepers and clan systems are still in place in modern communities today. Women also held significant positions of power in Wyandotte society and deathways in particular through their leadership positions and caring for the bones of their ancestors. And this is a picture of a reconstructed longhouse at Crawford Lake. Um, if any of you are able to go, it's just outside of Toronto. Um, it's a really amazing space that was built off of archeological reconstructions and excavations. Wyandotte deathways were elaborate and involved two main burial ceremonies and sites. These burial sites were village cemeteries and ossuary sites. I'm not going to cover the intimate details of the ceremonies here out of respect and direction from my community contacts, but I will explain the basics and some aspects that women participated in these earlier burials. 
Prior to contact, wind-up burial protocols were highly developed and complex in this period. The most common type of burial was through the Feast of Souls ceremony. Jesuit missionaries remarked in the Jesuit relations that wind-up burials were impressive and intricate, stating, quote, you might say that all their exertions, their labors, and their trading concern almost entirely the amassing of something with which to honor the dead, end quote. Only on these special occasions would the treasures of the Wyandotte Confederacy be displayed. Immediately following an individual's death, they received primary individual burial in the village cemetery, which was located next to the village outside of the palisaded walls. And these burials were either on the ground, on scaffolds or bark huts that is depicted in the uh, middle of the photo in the slides. Then after a 10 to 12 year period, all the individuals that had died over that time received their secondary burial in the ossuary known as the Feast of Souls. And an ossuary is a community burial pit. And the Feast of Souls was the main burial ceremony that they conducted when they were interring all these bones into the burial pit. And this, this ceremony involved the entire Wyandotte community where everyone came together and sometimes they also invited their neighboring communities to bury their dead together to solidify or renew alliances. So within both primary and secondary burials, women performed three main roles. First, Women constructed all the necessary goods for gift giving and ceremony, like food, weapons, smoking pipes, jewelry, anything you could think of. Second, women engaged in public acts of mourning, such as crying on cue at funerals. And third, women processed and protected ancestral remains to prepare for both individual and community burial. And this is an example in the slides of what a ossuary might have looked like. Um, this is a ossuary that can be found in Toronto, Ontario, in Scarborough, and it's called Tabor Hill Ossuary. And it's quite large. Um, it's from the 14th century, and it contains roughly over 500 people buried in this site. Disarticulating and washing the bones was a careful methodical duty that women did on behalf of their living relatives to ease the passing of their loved ones. A Jesuit missionary recalled a woman partaking in this duty for her family. I admired the tenderness of one woman toward her father and her children. She is the daughter of a chief who died in an advanced age and was once very influential in the country. She combed his hair and handled his bones, one after the other, with so much affection as if she would have desired to restore life to him. She put beside him his atsatsonawai, that is, his package of council sticks, which are all the books and papers of the country. As for her little children, she put on their arms bracelets of porcelain and glass beads and bathed their bones with her tears. They could scarcely tear her away from these, but they insisted. So through these burials, why not women condition their communities towards traditional goods, but also towards these spaces and these ancestors? As women cried over their relative souls and bones, Wyandots involved in the burial developed an array of memories, attachments, and commitments to their ancestors, as well as the land that they were buried in. And this work was really crucial for the success and well-being of Wyandotte people, and it gave them a way to function on a day-to-day -day basis and heal during these traumatic events of losing loved ones. A number of historians have researched the complex history surrounding Wyandotte burials and practices. So for instance, here on Wendat, George Siwi, he notes that the feast was the main way that Wyandots reinforced their traditional teachings, memories, and relationships. Eric Seaman, 
his detailed analysis of the feast demonstrates the spiritual nature of Wyandotte and non-Wyandotte encounters. Um, he has two main arguments. So first, he argues that religious practices among the Wyandotte, especially the feast, motivated the Wyandotte to seek trade and obtain ceremonial items and grave goods with Europeans and other neighboring Indigenous communities. And second, when Wyandots and Christians came together in the 1600s, they bonded over their mutual understandings of the power and bones and the centrality of burial practices within both of their societies. In her chapter, Fier le Chaudier, Catherine LaBelle also looks at the Feast of Souls, and she demonstrates how Wyandots used burial practices to build alliances with one another. Um, between settlers and between neighboring indigenous communities. And this created unity and solidarity among their family, friends, and neighbors. So combined, these scholars effectively highlight the importance of deathways in Wyandotte communities, especially in negotiating these cross-cultural encounters. Yet, they remained very grounded in the 17th century, with little research on Wyandotte deathways and spiritual beliefs later on. So my work builds on these important works and really expands Wyandotte deathway narratives beyond the 17th century, looking at the modern Anderton community. So after increased contact with settlers, uh, the Wyandotte did go through a dispersal period. And so Haudenosaunee military strikes in the 17th century resulted in a dispersal strategy that led to the relocation of Wyandotte communities throughout North America. Weakened by several epidemics and warfare, the Wyandotte abandoned Wendaki Ian around the Georgian Bay area and relocated to ancient Wyandotte sites, some of which were occupied by French or Iroquois peoples, such as to the east near Quebec City and the west near Michilimackinac. And the migrations continued beyond the 17th century as Wyandotte sought out new land and were removed and relocated from various government entities. And this led to an establishment of a diaspora of communities, which you can be shown in the slides here. Um, there was communities near the Detroit-Windsor Corridor, Upper Sandusky in Ohio, Kansas City, Kansas, and Wyandotte, Oklahoma. The group of Wyandots that eventually became known as the Wyandot of Anderton Nation are the descendants of the Western Wyandot who were forced to relocate from Georgian Bay in 1649. These Wyandots traveled west towards their Nipissing and French allies in what would become known as Michilimackinac, which is circled here on the map. There, the Wyandots settled separately from their European counterparts in a customary village made up of longhouses and fields and a palisade and a chapel. The chapel points to the continued presence of Christian converts within the Wyandot diaspora following contact with missionaries like the Jesuits. Historian LaBelle notes that the prospect of conversion was not new to these Wyandots even throughout the dispersal. Wyandotte communities even brought Jesuits with them during relocations, and they continued to convert throughout this process. She states that it, quote, balanced cultural compromise and identity preservation as they endeavored to both transform and maintain Wyandotte traditions within the community, end quote. Wyandotte women used Christianity as a means to create and preserve unity, spirituality, and social mobility. Essentially, during their time at Michelle and Mackinac, the Wyandotte formed what LaBelle terms a cultural matrix where both Wyandotte and Christian practices existed in these spaces equally. At the turn of the 17th century, French authorities were attempting to secure lands around what would become the Anderton Reserve along the Detroit River. Following a French official French policy, French settlers did not really recognize claims of ownership uh, to North American lands by indigenous people. Um, so they really just kind of began to establish themselves throughout the community um, without really regard for people that were already living there. 
And similar to the Wyandotte, settlers considered the entire Detroit River region one large community. So a lot of people would build households on either side of the river. And Detroit was really the main economic hub of the region. French governor Antoine Lamont de la Moth Cadillac, the founder of Detroit, highly encouraged indigenous settlement within this area as well as settler. And he quote, invited groups to settle in the area. According to Cadillac, the Wyandots also received these invitations. However, recently historians have began to question if he really did invite them or if indigenous people had already been living there before. So for instance, historian Guillaume Teasdale argues that it is highly unlikely French settlers would have been able to establish any kind of settlement without the approval of indigenous people living there. Further, settlement for the Wyandots was much easier as they had previous knowledge of the area and actively used the region as hunting grounds for millennia. So after a series of councils, the Wyandots decided to leave Michilimackinac and relocate to the Detroit area, establishing villages on either side of the river. And the Wyandot of Anderton Nation are the descendants of the 17th century Wyandot refugees and settling in the Detroit area around 1701 on what on the lands that would eventually become the Anderton Reserve in 1790. And you can see that pictured in the slides in the square box there. The Detroit River Wyandot established villages with sizable longhouses and fields, and they followed their traditions of cultivating corn, beans, and squash, while also introducing some French staples such as peas and wheat. Cadillac's plan for maintaining French sovereignty in the Great Lakes region rested on promises of religious, educational, diplomatic, and medical services, and that really drew in more settlers to the area. And as more settlers came, this kind of led to really close interactions between Wyandotte and French colonists, just how it had happened in previous generations. And this led to Wyandotte and French marriages and the adoption of some French policies and practices into the Wyandotte community, such as Catholic prayer and patriarchal social structures. However, the French were not the only people interested in this territory at the time. Um, there was a lot happening with the Seven Years' War, the American Revolution, and the War of 1812 that reshaped the Wyandotte settlement in significant ways. So for instance, uh, following the Seven Years' War, Detroit became a British stronghold rather than a French one. And the result was a sharp mandate by the British government to clear the land for British settlement and agriculture. Unlike their French counterparts, the British recognized indigenous claims to land. So to solidify plans for settlement, the Royal Proclamation was signed on the 9th of May in 1763. And essentially this proclamation stated that settlers had to engage in treaty making before establishing settlements on indigenous lands. And any other lands in North America were considered to be indigenous lands. So consequently, the British began to devise a lot of treaties with First Nations people. And these treaties established indigenous settlements that could then be integrated into British um, society in Upper Canada. And they really wanted to have counties with these townships that easily could be integrated into this. So continuing with the negotiations that began with the Niagara Treaties in 1781, British officials in the Wyandotte signed the McKee Treaty in 1790, which created two reserves in Essex County, one known as the Huron Church Reserve, which is later Sandwich, and then Anderton, which you can see in the slides here. And here's another map of the kind of the beginnings of the reserve when they started dividing everything into these um, plots of land that individuals could have their farms on. And in this red circle, that's the area that was designated for the cemetery. So of course there were some changes that did take place to wind up burials with all these relocations and interacting more with settlers and with Christianity. In 1727, the Wyandots living near Detroit sent a list of requests to Montreal that included an appeal for a missionary to be sent to the community. 
Consequently, French missionaries arrived in the territory in 1728 with Father Armand de la Ricciardi. And he developed strong ties to the nation and he actually was adopted into the deer and porcupine clans. And through positive relations with the Wyandots, Ricciardi established the first permanent settlement for Euro Christians in the Detroit Windsor area that he called L'Assumption de la Pointe de Montreal de Detroit or the mission of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin among the Hurons. In 1743, missionary Nicholas de Gonor arrived to aid Ricciardi and was adopted into the Striped Turtle Clan, uh, but he only remained for one year because he actually got really sick. In 1746, Pierre Pate arrived in his place, and Pate is pictured in the slides here. And he really focused on learning the Wyandotte language, and he recorded a whole bunch of information in this book, Le Écrit de Pierre Potier. And he included information about baptisms, marriages, deaths, and some notes on the um, makeup of Wyandotte houses and like who was clan mothers at the time. As more French settlers came to the area and began attending the Assumption Mission, a church was also created for the Wyandots and a parish of the Assumption was canonically erected in 1767. French, event, French officials eventually set up a permanent mission for the Anderton Wyandots. On the 1st of May in 1800, Quebec Bishop Pierre Deneau established several St. John the Baptist missions, including the Amherstburg and Malden Township missions. And Deneau visited the following year and negotiated the purchase of lands on Bathurst Street Amers and Amersburg for the Malden missions, which was completed in the autumn of 1802. And that same year, parochial records for the parishes highlighted both Euro-Christians and Indigenous peoples with specific reference to the Anderton Wyandots. Um, they would normally say Huron in their records. And by the 1820s, the missions were quite successful and attracted many converted Wyandots. In late May 1828, Bishop MacDonald of Kingston, Ontario appointed Father Louis J. Fluet to be the pastor of the Assumption Parish. And to accommodate this growing number of Christians in the area, um, they needed a larger church to be built. And the Wyandots actually donated 115 tons of stones for this church from their rock quarry in Anderton and contributed to the completion of the church the following January in 1844. A close relationship between the Anderton Wyandot and the missionaries provides evidence of historical continuity. Just as Wyandots and Wendaki Ian and Michel and Mackinac engaged with Christianity and European traditions, those living in the Detroit region also developed a cultural matrix where both Wyandotte and non-Wyandotte practices existed. And here's a couple examples of some of these changes that took place. So key to the 19th century colonial project were indigenous women who continually had to negotiate their positions within a new colonial world. Similar to the missionaries, these women were also negotiating Christian and traditional practices, sometimes adopting and creating hybrid practices, and sometimes maintaining their traditional ones. As Indigenous people face more hardships from encroaching settlers, colonialism, and warfare, their numbers were increasingly diminished, especially the men who were participating in warfare. As a result, some women were drawn to converting to Christianity as a means of survival to marry settler men in the area. Conversion was also particularly useful for those facing American Indian removal policies who could use conversion in their marriages as, quote, a means of accommodation rather than transformation, end quote. Although they were converting to Christianity, these women were not losing their power or their traditional practices. Historian Karen Marrero argues that Indigenous women held pivotal positions of authority in their Detroit communities. They had positions in French European operations like commerce and trade, just as they had done in their pre-contact communities. 
Marrero explains how indigenous women, even those married settlers at the time, continued to practice their own way of life, child rearing, trade, agriculture, clan systems, and politics, because indigenous women, quote, processed authority and freedom of movement at every level of their society, end quote. Just as pre-contact indigenous women exercised their authority, built cultural practices, and established societal rules, 19th century Wyandotte women were leaders and clan mothers throughout their Detroit re region. Women effectively maintained their historic roots and incorporated French customs when they saw benefits or opportunities. The exact details surrounding the establishment of the Wyandotte Cemetery are unknown. While answers to questions such as when and how this burial came into existence, there are extensive records pertaining to other aspects of its development, providing a window into the early years of its existence. The cemetery today is located on the Canadian side of the Detroit River, which was within the boundary of the Anderton Reserve. The cemetery contains several trees and a small single chain fence, and on the east side of the cemetery, the land is divided by a private home, which you can kind of see in the picture in the slides. And then on the west side, um, not in the picture, it, there is a small park named Am Angstrom Park. The descendants of the Anderton and Wyandots estimate that there's roughly 450 people living here. I'm sorry, buried here. And although there are indications of earlier burials, the first recorded burial is of the renowned Wyandotte chief, Joseph White's mother, 90-year-old uh, Margaret Deliante. On the 29th of April in 1856, she had passed and was buried here. Only some burials can still be seen in the cemetery as most individuals remain in unmarked graves and some people's tombstones have been destroyed over time as well. The cemetery was predominantly Catholic and was the site of numerous funerals for Wyandotte men, women, and children. And today the gravestones and family plots can still be seen, although countless others, like I said, have been eroded or lost due to neglect, urbanization, and weathering. Today there's roughly about 20 stones that can still be seen, um, but it has been far better preserved than some other Wyandotte uh, sacred sites in the vicinity. For instance, the neighboring Protestant cemetery that was on the reserve was actually destroyed um, sometime in the 1900s. Anderton and Wyandotte historians Lil Splitlog and Yvonne Gibbs reported in 1981 that the only two headstones remained at the uh, Protestant cemetery, and likely there have been houses built over this cemetery. It was located roughly 100 meters away from the cemetery um, in the slides here. As settlers, Christianity, and colonial government policies continued to shape the Wyandotte of Anderton community, men did begin to take on more prominent roles in burial spaces. They took on more prominent roles in baptisms, marriages, and funerals. And 19th century missionaries favored the men, which is reflected in a lot of the church records I looked at. And here pictured in the slides is some of the books that I was able to see at the St. John the Baptist Mission Church records, which are housed at the Diocese of London Church Archives. The St. John the Baptist Registry demonstrates several distinctions in the missionary records that highlight the incorporation of patriarchal values into the Anderton community. During the 1800s, female names were not recorded first, but were recorded following their husband's names. And this remained really consistent throughout the 19th century. Um, so for instance, um, male names appeared um, often in both records of parents' names, but also sponsors of the, uh, the baptisms. And throughout the century, some missionaries even went so far as to record women only by their husband's names, never including their first name. So for instance, Mrs. Moyen, who is Charlie Moyen's wife, who sponsored a baptism. Uh, we don't know what her first name is or what any of her matrilineal ties would have been, 
Uh, additionally, Mrs. Joseph Waro, who was buried on the 23rd of August in 1889, uh, we're not sure what her first name or her matrilineal ties are. These omissions show the emphasis on the importance of patrilineal family ties at the time. Whereas prior to contact, Wyandots identified with their female clan and their clan names. Individuals are now identifying by their male family names. The material culture of the cemetery also seems to suggest that the society really privileged men. For instance, leading male members of the community had the largest standalone tombstones, some of which can still be seen today. A really good example of this is Mondoron, chief of the Wyandots, and this is Joseph White Stone. His other relatives are buried nearby, it says on the stone. So really just privileging him and a little bit less attention giving to his children and his wife. So these stones demonstrate the shift to valuing and memorializing male Wyandotte leaders rather than the clan mothers who had formerly elected them. Male privilege is further demonstrated in the size of White's last name, demonstrating patrilineality rather than those matrilineal connections. And another noteworthy aspect of the tombstones is that there is a lot of Christian iconography and religious symbols like crosses and religious text. Despite those changes, there is still a lot of Wyandotte continuity and resilience. Other sources indicate that for the most part, the 19th century Wyandotte of Anderton Nation maintained many of their traditional practices. For instance, Wyandots continued to speak their own language. Wyandots also continued to live in traditional bark houses with rounded roofs modeled after customary longhouses. And their social organization using clan systems remained intact throughout the colonial period and are still intact today. John Steckley has done extensive work on the subject, providing evidence of the continuation of these clans. The clan systems were dynamic social groups that enabled women to maintain their leadership and provide stability throughout the diaspora and during the reserve period of the Andred and Wyandots. Steckley further explains that the seemingly overt Christian and patriarchal nature of the cemetery, in actuality, many Wyandots were likely buried without Christian services because often Wyandots did not wish to have Christian proceedings at their funerals, and some of them did not want tombstones. Furthermore, many Christian ceremonies went undocumented before Potier arrived in 1746. For 19th century Wyandotte people, the relationship between ancestral remains and the land provided critical references for spiritual, historical, and cultural guidance. Burial grounds connected the living with the dead and created a space for unity and community building. Steckley observed in early missionary writings that most of the sponsors and hosts were clan member of, were clan mothers, more significantly women, he noted that, quote, rituals of mourning was definitely women's work among the Wyandotte of the 18th century, end quote. So despite this onslaught of Christianity and associated patriarchal attitudes, Wyandotte women actively maintained their clan systems and their familial ties, while securing their authority in domestic spheres like community longhouses, fields, and cemeteries. And this resiliency is shown in different aspects of Wyandotte burial practices. So my last couple slides are some case studies to show how Christian and Wyandotte practices were coming together. 19th century Wyandotte women continued their leadership in burials like that of the previous generations. Just as their pre-contact ancestors had done centuries before, women ensured proper healing for Wyandots during times of grief, preparing the body for the funeral. The funeral of 19th century Wyandotte woman Eliza Splitlog delivers important insight into the nature of Wyandotte burials during this period. On Sunday morning of September 28th in 1884, 65-year-old Eliza passed away. She was the proud daughter of the Wyandotte chief John Barnett and his wife Hannah, and she died a Christian. 
Immediately following her death, her entire community prepared for the funeral and the feast. Wyandotte men were appointed to dig the grave and build a fire. Simultaneously, leaders in the community began preparations for an elaborate feast. Wyandotte women prepared the necessary goods for this farewell feast. Women who belonged to the death house where Eliza died bruised themselves in grief and conducted traditional Wyandotte ceremonies like saging the house. And influenced by settler practices, the women lit candles and covered all the pictures and mirrors in black cloth. And during her funeral services, Eliza received both Wyandotte and Christian blessings. So female authority and maintenance in death spaces was not diminished after contact, but rather just reorganized. The majority of the work continued to be done by the women. And Eliza's case shows that settler religions like Christianity were not able to completely erase Wyandotte belief systems, but rather Christianity and Wyandotte practices came together to exist equally in the space. Another case study is Katie Kokoa and her daughter, Mary McKee. Following the War of 1812, famous Wyandotte war chief Kokoa accepted a property on the Huron River after his involvement in the war for a 50-term lease. Unfortunately, the chief did not see this term through. After two short years, Chief Kokoa died. He was buried nearby with a headstone to mark his grave. The chief's daughter, Katie Kokoa, remained in the cabin with her daughter, defending her father's grave from encroaching settlers with a loaded shotgun. This act of protection is highly reminiscent of pre-contact women who frequented the village cemeteries to maintain their ancestors' resting places and bones between their community burials. And this further re reiterates the centrality of burial spaces to Wyandots, but also to Wyandot women. Katie's passion to protect Wyandotte grave sites was passed on to her daughter, Mary McKee, who was born in 1838. Reluctant to leave her father's grave in the family cabin, but fearful of forced relocations to Indian country in the 1830s, Katie and Mary left the cabin and her father's grave and settled across the river with their Anderton kin. Mary learned a great deal from her mother during her formative years. Like her mother, Mary became known as one of the most prominent healers among the Detroit River Wyandotte, and she relied mainly on traditional practices. And through their work restoring and maintaining community well-being, these women sustained traditional Wyandotte knowledge. And speaking about women's work, through interviews with French-Canadian ethnographer Marius Barbeau, Mary further contributed to the protection and preservation of Wyandotte history and culture. During their visits, Mary gave Barbeau details concerning traditional knowledge, material culture, songs, and oral histories. In 1915, Mary actually sold Barbeau some of her mother's possessions that were all made by women. And she also donated some of her own items like food utensils and tools and ornamental leggings, uh, some of which are pictured in the slides on the left here. Continuing her mother's legacy, the act of transferring these items to Barbeau illustrates Mary's motivations to preserve Wyandotte culture and practices for her descendants, just as her ancestors had done for thousands of years. Mary McKee's tombstone reads, quote, Mary Tarima McKee, April 8, 1838 to June 11, 1922. Granddaughter of Wyandotte Chief Kokoa, Mary was a keeper of traditions during turbulent times. And turbulent times called for a return to traditional protocols. Mary and her mother responded to the colonial threats against their community and their father's grave. And both generations of women constructed the necessary goods for their community, which were vital to emotional healing and well being. Moreover, these women fulfilled their roles as leaders, taking active steps to protect their ancestral homelands, deathways, and burial spaces. So in conclusion, throughout the reserve period from 1790 to 1914, the Wyandotte of Anderton Nation experienced many changes. 
At first glance, it would seem that settler land acquisition and military zeal transformed the Anderton community into a seemingly predominant Christian and patriarchal society. Yet, upon further investigation, it becomes clear that pre-contact practices had not been erased or forgotten. Wyandots continued their traditional social organization through clan systems and family segments, which is also emphasized by the cemetery tombstone groupings. Thus, Wyandots responded to death in innovative and complex ways, even throughout the diaspora and their removal. Further, women continued to maintain their leadership in funerals as the deceased individuals received elaborate funerals with Wyandotte and Christian elements to enable community healing, maintain culture, and create bonds to traditional spaces. An overview of Wyandotte women and burial practices with a focus on the 19th century Wyandotte cemetery supports what other scholars have found to be true in the 17th century. Anderton women actively negotiated their place in colonial Christian societies and established connections to their lands and burials through ceremony. Sometimes Wyandots chose to adopt Christianity, while other times Wyandots relied on their traditional teachings. Together, Wyandot women successfully took care of their communities for the 19th century and beyond. Tisa May, Tia Wink, Merci, thank you all so much for coming, and I look forward to having some questions and discussion. Stop sharing screen here. Louis. Kelvy, I have a question. Yeah, of course. So back to the burial locations, uh, burial number one location, and then uh, burial number two. Um, once the burial has taken place in number two, was number one ever used again? Hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. So the individual burials in the village cemeteries um, were really temporary sites. Um, some, and this kind of co corresponds with the villages themselves. So the villages were created once every 10 to 12 years, same with the cemeteries. Sometimes these village locations would be revisited generations later. Um, but sometimes they wouldn't. So it just depends on if people were returning to that site. Um, so mostly the first burial site were temporary. And then the community burial with these ossuaries, that's where we have like Tabor Hill and a lot of other ossuaries that are throughout Southern Ontario. And those are the permanent ones. And there's a bunch of those in Southern Ontario. You can, there's some maps um, where there's I don't know, hundreds of these sites. Okay, great. Um, and then another question. Um, so when they were relocated or, you know, forced off their lands or had to move, it sounds like, so maybe they just left these, uh, these mounds or the ossuaries. So they did not um, feel compelled to, you know, take their um, ancestors' bones with them to the new location. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Um, so sometimes, yeah, like you said, the villages would be abandoned for like warfare reasons or fires or some natural disaster. Sometimes they, this was part of their um, agricultural practices as well. Once they've used the fields um, for a certain amount of time, they would go to a different area to get um, better crops again. And they would not bring their, the bones of their ancestors with them. They would stay in these mounds. Great, thanks. Pat, I think you have a couple questions. Yes, I do. And um, the one says, when the women were washing the bones of the dead, how much time had elapsed since the death? Mm. Were the dead cremated, for example, or exactly? So it just depended on when the individual passed away. Um, so the ossuaries took place every 10 to 12 years. So if you died, 
at the beginning, there was an ossuary that just happened. Likely by the time it got to the next ossuary, you would be quite decomposed and there was probably only bones left. But sometimes, like in the case uh, that I talked about from the Jesuit relation, sometimes there would still be flesh left over, um, hair, and the women actually took care in cleaning these bones and they would actually strip off the flesh themselves before preparing the bones for the community burial. Um, so it just really depended on when the individual died and how long they had in the village cemetery before being buried in the big community ossuary. Okay, that makes sense now because I kind of had the same question trying to envision this. Um, and another one, um, someone says, I have the book Anderton, Some Folks Down the Road, written by Mark Warren in 2012. And Warren grew up in Anderton at the time of publication, was living in Nova Scotia. This book is a history of the township from 1812 to 2012 and includes some basic genealogies of many Wyandotte and white families. He mentions the Anderton Cemetery as well as the names of several people buried there. The person asks, do you know the book? And by the nod of your head, I assume that you do. Yep, I do know the book. Um, I used it for my research, actually. Um, it's super informative if you're looking for um, genealogy. He does a really good job of outlining all the records of people he found, people he thinks that are buried in the cemetery. Um, and then I use some of the other materials like from um, the Diocese of London Church archives. Um, I use some oral histories from the community to kind of piece together um, other things that he wasn't able to find out. Um, I also remember the book being a little bit expensive. I don't know if it's available online for people or not, but um, it's definitely handy to look for if you're doing genealogy stuff. So the, did you say there were about 20 headstones in the cemetery now? Yeah, when I visited, which was oh, before COVID, so like three years ago-ish now, um, there was about 20 stones that were remaining okay. and some of them you could read some of them had been quite weathered um and then yeah that was that was about it so do you know if there's a book with the transcriptions in it that may have been done before i know going back to when i took over my current position as, as the cemetery chair for the branch we um there's a notation that there's library holdings so that cemetery wasn't transcribed by us. So I don't know yeah. about that. Yeah, it's, um, I'm pretty sure it was done by the, on, I think it was done by the Ontario Genealogical Society and it's held at um, the Archives of Ontario. There is a oh, book. Okay. Yeah. Um, I can definitely look up the, the citation and find it for you, but it, there's definitely one that's at the Archives of Ontario that I looked at. Oh, okay. Yeah, and um, I think that was done in the 90s, I think. Yeah, it could be. They started the late 80s doing cemeteries in the region and some more in the 90s and then now, of course. So. Um, yeah, and there shouldn't be any restrictions on that. Um, I was able to just look at it. Um, yeah. And I know also um, there was a notation on our file that the cemetery was fully photographed and was on the Canadian Gen Web, Gen Web um, Cemetery website. Um, now it's undergone some changes recently, so I'm not sure how easily accessible it is, but that's another, um, another spot. Mm, yeah, that one I'm not sure about. I don't remember looking at that myself, but that does sound like a really good resource if they were yeah. able to document some of that stuff. Um, and there's another question. What is the significance of having the two separate burials? The two so, of us here tonight grew up about a kilometer south of the cemetery. Mm, okay. Um, so yeah, it's sometimes when you get back that far in history um, before records were really being kept, it's a little bit hard to determine exactly why people did this. Um, but from what I did, my research, and then some of the other historians who have researched it um, that I talked about, like George Seawee, um, Eric Seaman, and Catherine LaBelle, um, we've kind of all, and with talking to the community as well, the modern descendants of the community, um, 
a lot of it had just developed out of the ideas and notions of being community first rather than individual first. And it kind of developed alongside that practice of this is our agricultural practices, these are our fields, we can only stay here for so long and then we have to go somewhere else so that we don't exhaust all of our soils. And in my actual thesis, I go over, I start with burials from the year zero and I just go through archeological records and try to piece together how this happened. Um, and originally it just started, sometimes families wanted to be buried together and then that developed into, well, we want our clan to be buried together, which developed into, we want our, our whole town to be buried together. And then this kind of developed into these cross-cultural relations that we see, like they wanted to renew or solidify an alliance with say the Haudenosaunee or the Algonquin. And because burials were such an important aspect in Wyandotte society, and because the bones themselves were so important is that a really good way to bring together people and really hit home that you are allies was to bury your dead together. So there's kind of a lot of different reasons and it did develop over like thousands of years. Um, but as historians, you know, we can only do so much and I don't know if we'll ever know the exact reason, but these are kind of some of the reasons people think that that happened. Oh, oh, interesting. Cindy, I don't have any other questions. Okay, um, just one more. The St. John Baptist record that you showed us um, that you viewed at the diocese, um, which years did they cover? Do you recall? Um, I looked at the ones that were later 1700s and then early 1800s. So roughly 1750 to 1850. Um, and I think I did look at some of the earlier ones, but I know they had a whole bunch of other ones that I didn't look at. Um, and the um, archivist there, Deborah, uh, she is really awesome. She's super nice. Um, if anyone is ever interested, I'm sure if you just emailed her, she would be more than happy to direct you to sources that they have or um, even any like family history that she knows about. Um, they had like they had a whole back room full of documents that I didn't even scratch the surface on. Boy, that sounds like uh, that would be a gold mine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then just one more thing. So the um, cemetery protection, it really has come full circle. Um, you mentioned that was the women's, uh, that was their main role. And it really has become a mission of Ontario ancestors and most of the branches, we are all passionate about preserving cemeteries. So the, you know, the torch has been passed and I, I, I think we, we still are striving for that. So that, I think that kind of connects us that that was so important to them. And it really, even today is very important to us as well as genealogists. So thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I know this is also like a very weird thing about the cemetery is, um, so the Andrew and Wyandotte's don't exist on the Canadian side. Um, their modern community is actually on the Detroit side, but they don't have federal recognition from the US or from Canada. So the Canadian government holds this cemetery in trust for a community that they don't recognize. Um, and the Anderton community is currently working on reinstating their federal recognition. And they actually just received rights to take care of the burial ground again. Um, John Cutting, they gave permission to, and this happened like in like 2016, they just got rights again to like take care of the cemetery. Um, so there's definitely a lot of community want right now to kind of preserve things and kind of get their rights back over the space. Oh, hi, McKelvey, it's Linda. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just wondering, uh, isn't there some um, feeling against uh, photographing the cemetery stones that the, the nation, you know, the actual nation would re request that we do not do that? Right. And this is also tricky because a little bit, it depends who you talk to. Um, but uh, the faith, the seated faith keeper of the Anderton Nation, um, Catherine Tamaro, um, she 
she doesn't want any photographs um, like posted online or um, anything like that because it is a sacred space and um, a lot of the faith keepers across the confederacy do see it as disrespectful um so i always just recommend if people are like interested in taking photos or um like anything like that is just to kind of connect with the community um if people are kind of interested in that um i know for myself i try um not to post the photos online like i just use the photo of like the cemetery gate instead of like individual tombstones and stuff and um is there anyone in the Windsor, Amherstburg, Anderton area? Like, is there an actual community now? Uh, like you said, to, to talk to the community before we would, you know, want to do anything with the cemetery. Uh, but is there anybody in this area or is it all over Detroit? I think the cuttings live in Windsor, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, they are mostly on the Detroit side, and then there are Wyandots who also live in Ontario as well, like um, the Faith Keeper, she lives in Toronto. Um, and that's kind of the tricky thing with the Wyandots is because they were dispersed, they kind of live all over. Um, but I do know that a lot of the chiefs um, from the community, they do frequent the cemetery, like, um, well, before COVID, COVID did interrupt that a little bit, but individuals will make their way across the river to come and visit the cemetery. Um, but if you guys are interested in talking to them, I definitely can give you some contact information and stuff for sure. Okay, great, great. So if there are no more questions, I just want to thank McKelvey for this excellent presentation. It's been very interesting, very informative, and it really is amazing that, at least in my generation, we were never taught about our own local Indigenous history, and hopefully this webinar will create a renewed interest in discovering more about this Wyandotte Nation, since they were the first inhabitants of Anderton Township. Um, so thank you again for for uh, doing this for us. And for everybody else, I'm going to close the meeting now and hopefully we will see you in November. Yeah, no problem. Um, I also put my email in the chat if anyone's ever interested in talking about anything more or anything like that. I'm always available. Oh, and yes, I see it there. McKelvey.Kelly at usask.ca. Yeah. yeah. And then that's just a quick link to the Wyandotte of Anderton website as well, if anyone's interested in looking at it. They've got lots of pictures and history things on there. So, so who takes care of that website? Uh, the Chiefs and Council do. Okay, okay, great. Okay, we'll have to take a look at that for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're beyond our time. So uh, I'll close the meeting now. And thank you again, McKelvey. No problem. Okay, bye everybody.